Welcome to Fast Company TV's Avoiding the Fail Whale webinar about how three companies approach the problem of building a scalable and reliable web service. This webinar is sponsored by Rackspace. Rackspace offers hosting for your web-based business. I got a tour of their new headquarters earlier this year, which is up on fastcompany.tv, and what they do for entrepreneurs and businesses is quite impressive. This webinar will be interactive with our live audience around the world. To join in, just chat in the box below the video, and we'll uh, be taking your questions in about 30 minutes, including uh, questions we've already received over Twitter and FriendFeed. For those of you on the conference call, we'll also be taking a few select questions, but I'd encourage you to use the chat, chat box to talk with the moderators. Now let's get on with it and introduce today's guests. Uh, first, we have Paul Bushite, who is one of the founders of FriendFeed, which I'm constantly using and a, a, a big addict of. And he's also the creator of Gmail and also is the guy who came up with Google's admonition to not be evil. Next we have Nat Brown, CTO of iLike, a music community service that had one of the first popular Facebook applications. Uh, finally, we have Dorian Carroll, who is the uh, VP of Engineering at Technorati and has been there for four years. He's seen a 30-fold increase in indexing from 3.5 million blogs to more than 130 million. Welcome to all three of you, and uh, thanks for joining us. Thanks. And now I'd like to start with you, because um, let's talk about the role that hardware and capitalization plays in, in, uh, in uh, scalability. Okay. Tell us a, about the first six days of that Facebook craze. Yeah, that was pretty crazy. Uh, Facebook launched their platform on a, on a Thursday, and we watched the traffic grow a little bit. Um, by Friday night, though, it was very clear that, it, that our application and a lot of other applications had gone viral. And we predicted that we were going to have 7 million users in about 50 times the, the scale of traffic by Tuesday morning. So we headed into Memorial Day weekend, Friday at 10 PM, making that projection going, we're not going you know, to survive Tuesday morning. So we threw everything we had at the, at the software, and then we sent out a plea for help to everyone we knew and said, we need 100 servers, like, now. Um, and eventually we paid for them. It took, took a while for us to get out from under that. But we had to rewrite some portions of the application. We had to, you know, shuck 100 servers and spin them up. And we were live on Tuesday morning, and, and we, we haven't fallen since. Um, but yeah, knowing when a spike like that is coming is almost impossible. Um, so you have to be able to react quickly. Fortunately, we were able to just scale scale out very quickly. Yeah, I, I asked that question because I, I remember being in Zoomer's data center when they were down for a week, yeah. and they were very un undercapitalized. <coughs> they were undercapitalized with people, so they didn't yeah. have enough bodies to throw at the problem like yep. you guys did. You yep. had a, at least a, a pretty sizable team that could go and call people and beg yeah. for servers and yeah. deal with the software issues and stuff like that. Yeah, if, if we hadn't had um, some contacts, um, that had servers available, we none of our vendors like they went home for the weekend. Our our data center, we needed to build out a whole new cage in our data center in our, uh, Equinix there in Santa Clara. They were like, you know, we're there. You know, we, we pulled in people. We're going to build out your your new cage. Um, our hardware vendors were kind of not not there yet. We weren't yet using Sun equipment. I think Sun would have jumped on it. Um, our other vendors at the time, it was the Memorial Day weekend. They were. Not responding. So, yeah. so um, yeah, it, it really pays to to have s have set up your relationships, <laughs> yeah. for sure, and your vendors. Yeah. So, uh, Paul, uh, one of the reasons I chose FriendFeed over the, uh, the, all the other aggregators was your team came from Google, right? And I figured that the Google team would know something about scalability because they always made pages that were fast and reliable. And sure enough, over the last uh, nine months I've been on the service, it's it's provided that, right? I was on. Uh, during the debates, refreshing your page every three seconds, and it was instant coming back. Uh, how do you build that kind of scalability, and what's the Google secret sauce that you brought over from, from FriendFeed, because you helped build the Gmail service? Right. right. I, you know, I don't know if there is any one secret sauce. I, I think the, if there was, though, <laughs> it would basically just be to always measure everything. Uh, you know, the, the strangest thing I've realized is talking to uh, different startups is they're having performance problems, and I started asking them questions, you know, how long how long do you take to, to service a request? All, all these questions, they don't know answers to, to any of their timing uh, questions. So if you, if you know how fast everything is and you know, uh, you know the different parts of your request, where that time is going, how much time are you talking to the database, how much data are you moving around, uh, then a lot of times you can make these predictions. And if you just keep everything fast all the time, then you're, you're prepared for, uh, 
for spikes in traffic as well. Yeah, you, uh, Rackspace is sponsoring this because they have the Mosa <laughs> service, and they they're seeing a new kind of web company coming out. Right, uh, Mogulus when they came and did their interview, they bragged about not owning a single server. Right, everything was up on the cloud right. in various services. Are you seeing what are you seeing happen there, and how is that affecting your your scalability? Uh, you know, I think that's a really good trend uh, for us. We've actually chosen to do most of it ourselves. We put our images in in S3 just because that was the the quick and easy way to make sure they're all backed up and secure and, and we don't have to worry about that part of the of the puzzle but everything else is actually on servers that we uh, that we've configured and own and, and everything else because we want to control the configuration yeah you you, you t talked to well we'll get back to talking about how to how to build in the testing and the and the um, you know the scalability how to test that beforehand before you build your system um, you had a different problem you have you were the, one of the first sites to go and try to index the, the live web, right? And right. what we call the live web. Now FriendFeed is doing it too, but yeah. what kind of challenge does having an indexer going around and pulling together that data and trying to keep the databases all up and running uh, provide, you know, tell me a little bit about the system at Technorati. With seven, you have 700 servers, We right? have 700 servers. Uh, actually, only about 30 of them are dealing with the, the front end web tier. Uh, what we found has been successful for us, and we've probably gone through four significant architectural shifts in the four years that I've been there, but uh, making sure that we could take advantage of a few things that were loose constraints and then dealing with things that really were hard and fast constraints that we couldn't move. So for instance, our primary charter for the first three years was to be near real time. Yeah. So we wanted to be able to have you know, minimal latency, less than two minutes from the point where somebody hits publish on their blog to where it's available, fully indexed in query results. We said we didn't want to drop things, but we didn't necessarily have to have everything uh, fully backed up and ready to go. So caching became a really uh, successful trick for us. One of the key things was to be able to segment the architecture. So we have data acquisition systems, yeah. persistence systems, indexing and search services. And then on the web tier, it's basically talking to a service-oriented architecture. So we don't have to worry that if the crawlers bog down, the website's still up and running. If the website bogs down, the crawlers can still run. If we have to do maintenance on something, we can stop things. Clearly, that'll impact the, the latency, but uh, if that's what's required. So having a loosely coupled architecture made things work pretty well for us. Yeah, avoiding the fail well. And we all saw Twitter have, have a lot of uh, troubles. But Twitter is a different kind of business than all three of yours. What are you seeing in your business? What are you worried about? What keeps you up at night? <laughs> Maybe uh, start. Uh, you know, I think at, at the stage where we are right now, the, my biggest concern is just that, you know, if you have some sort of catastrophic failure. At Google, we had, I don't know, a, an unknown number of data centers. Like, literally no one knew there were that many. Uh, and, you know, at FriendFeed, we're, we're in one data center. If something bad happened, we'd be offline. Uh, and that's and we just have to deal with that. So there's we're much more vulnerable to those sorts of problems yeah. uh, than than are people operating at larger scale. Are you ever planning to get um, uh, you know data centers in separate cities? So if an earthquake hits San Francisco, someday, and totally someday. Us out. Uh, <laughs> but it's you know when you when you kind of list out all the all the things that are urgent, that one ends up being a little bit further down the list. Okay, like Google agree. actually <laughs> operated up a single data center for at least a year or two early on. Yeah. yeah. So. Yeah, the sa same with us. That, that's probably the thing that worries me the most is even though we've taken, you know, we, s we start out with a small number of master databases and we slowly have partitioned the data to, to, um, to kind of partition I.O., um, especially write I.O. Even though we've done that, um, there, there still are some vulnerable points in the system and geographically that, that's the thing. That, so we're very careful uh, with them and we put them on us on the best combination of equipment that we can to reduce the, the potential there, but um, but yeah, until you reach another level of scale, you don't <laughs> you see in certain certain core systems. Well, it's an interesting uh, trade-off too, because yeah. on the one hand, you know, you're trying to scale a business, and the business can't scale if you're stuffing everything into your data center and your operations in order to maintain five nines of reliability. So yeah. if you're spending all your money on your infrastructure and your operations you'll never grow the business. On the other hand, if you're not reliable and you can't scale, the you won't grow the business. Grow. So <laughs> yeah. it, it's a combination of playing nice with the finance folks and <clears throat> figuring out how to solve your own problem. Well, and that's where Twitter f f fell into the trap, right? They, 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 d they didn't know that this thing was going to go supernova and they planned it you know, over a couple of weeks to be something different than it, what it became, yeah. right? They didn't plan it 
to be a messaging system that was on CNN being used by the debates, right? Yeah. They planned it to be a micro-blogging tool, which was going to be a, a lot less load than, than yeah. what it, it's already seeing. And it, it's not even mainstream yet, right? Yeah. They're, they're, they got, what, three million users. They're not to the Facebook scale, right? Yeah. And yet the, the, you know, the, the issue there is changing the wheels on the, on the rolling race car or the train or the bus or whatever you want to call it. Um, we've changed the, the wheels on our car like probably five or six times here in two years. We've done structural changes that take five minutes of downtime in the middle of the night, but really are a deep re-architecture of scale points that we've hit. Um, and most of those, most of those we, we knew that they would eventually come. You, kn you knew that do this transaction. Um, so we knew we would have to pay the piper if we got, if we got big. Um, but we, we pretty much designed those systems so and, and the engine and the, and the chassis and the chairs while, while the whole thing's moving down the highway. Yeah. Um, what, what advice would you have to somebody who's starting a business right now in terms of thinking about scalability? You touched on it, uh, putting it in a test so that you at least instrument and right. know where the problems are right. so you can go in and rewrite I think that's, those that's one of the biggest things, to just know where you are you know, all the time. And uh, beyond that, I think really what's key is just being uh, very agile and be able to respond to these problems quickly. So you know, if you do run into a problem, you kind of scramble and hit rewrite the system or whatever it takes. But if you're, if you're fast enough, you can, yeah. you can uh, take a lot of shortcuts earlier on, yeah. which lets you get out there faster. You know, people talk a lot about, about Twitter's problems, but uh, it's important to remember that they actually built something that people really like, which most startups never do. And, they, yeah. and a lot of that was because they did put something out there very early on that they weren't really sure was you know, when, I think when most people, when they heard about Twitter, they said, well, that's the dumbest idea I've ever heard. But then they, they kind of like got into it, and a lot of people really love it now. Uh, but if they had planned, you know, a project that was going to take two years to build or something, they probably would have said, well, it's not worth the cost to, to make that kind of investment. So. I mean, part of it is just, you know, knowing what problem you're trying to solve or admitting you don't know what problem you're trying to solve, and you're just going to put something out there and, and yeah. see what it can do. You know, you, again, it's a balance between time about it. You, it has to do what you want it to do, so function yeah. is important. It has to perform to some extent, because otherwise nobody can actually use the thing it's supposed to do. It needs to be reliable. Uh, if it's not reliable, that's not going to do you any good. It ought to be easy to use. That'll make people you know, want to use it. But the other things that I think are important, measurement is one of them, but management and maintainability. Yeah. If, if you build something that is you know, that you know, incredibly unique one line of pearl that only you know, uh, and nobody else can troubleshoot it, what's the point? So yeah. if, if you're going to be morphing and adapting, you have to have something that your developers can actually deal with. Yes, yesterday I was talking to the founder of MindTouch, and he said he, architecturally he's built, it, it's not a monolithic system. He's built a, a bunch of different components. Each one is discrete, and each one talks to each other through REST APIs. Yeah. Does that kind of architectural choice sound good? Uh, and, and why or why not? Uh, the, the tiers of the app talking in a, in a, in a restful way layers of, of your application is good. Like um, we use Ruby on Rails, so we have uh, we have the, the database, the database architecture, and the operational layout of it. Then we have uh, a set of business logic; they're called models in, in Ruby. And then we have views that 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 and, and actions that take these these things and project them into HTML or into FB. Yeah. Google IG. We're able to project it onto Facebook, and that's very easy. So those loosely coupled layers are good. Um, in several places where we do maybe do restful things, uh, we actually find that it conge can congest up the system because it's, so if, if your web server has to call another server to get something done, uh, you could be tying up a thread. Depending on what your architecture is, you could be tying up a front end thread and it could get stuck for a while. I mean, we even see that really blow it. <laughs> I mean, we actually did, about three years ago, adopt a service-oriented architecture. We sort of went on the, the march to eliminate all SQL from the, the front-end tier, which seemed like a good idea. Um, that helped us a lot in a number of ways. We've, you know, as we've grown and as we've brought in engineers, you know, a lot of our early philosophy was, you know, three guys in three days can do something amazing, throw the spaghetti against the wall, see what sticks. But with that, quite often, with short deadlines, it's like, well, what do you know? Well, I, I code in Python, so all of a sudden this thing would appear in Python. And then as we moved more from the indexing within MySQL over into 
you've seen, well, that's Java. So then we started writing a lot more Java. Yeah. Our front end needed to be able to deal with things that might be in a database, might be coming out of a search engine. So creating that abstraction layer within a you know, service tier made it really easy for us to move quickly on the front end. Uh, we said, you know, okay, let's make the service tiers do all the caching. So all the memcache, when something started to slow down, we just implemented that in the service tier. The front end didn't have to change. Yeah. Over time, that started to become a bottleneck in and of itself. Mm -hmm. you know, the overhead of an extra HTTP request, yeah. getting things in and out of memcache, assuming you're not bottlenecking, yep. is really efficient. Yeah. So we moved some of the memcache logic up into the front end tier, yep. you know, pass through cache so you can get it out of the cache. If it's not there, go to the service. The service puts it in the cache, so the next request will get it out of the cache. Mm -hmm. Sometimes the front end can put things in the cache as well. I think you know, caching can be a, uh, a blessing and a curse. Uh, one of the, the aspects of memcache, depending on how you configure it, might be, all right, I've got 16 servers, and I'm distributing all of this data across of them. If any one of them goes out, yeah. well, that cache data isn't available, so you're going to be hitting the back end. So if your yeah. back end is architected to assume everything's in RAM and memcache is going to take care of you, yeah. you lose one, two, or three of those slices, and yeah. your back end will crumble. That's, that's yeah. the thundering herd, and that yeah. of sort of in the past and doesn't work at scale is, Oh, it's not in the cache. I'll I'll do it. I'll render it. I'll do the database hits, and and you have all those layers of cache, and as they fail, it just gets worse and worse, yeah. and every, everything spirals out of control. So, designing even all the way up to the UI to say it's okay for this area to be blank, <laughs> exactly, <laughs> because it, I I simply don't have the data, and the correct thing to do is not to not to generate the data because I might have fifty thousand people doing that this minute, and that would that would tear everything down. Um, the correct thing to do is to let the let the cache layer know that it needs to fill that line and get it out of the way. Yeah. Tell me some tips on, on caching that you guys have all learned. Because I, when I when I was with um, Mark Zuckerberg, he, he was talking with the, the CEO of uh, of uh, <laughs> Second Life about caching and how how e each of them were using it and. They were rattling off tips back and forth to each other. Give me some s some stuff that you've learned in your careers about how to how to use memcache or how to use caching properly. Uh, you know, I think the biggest thing is just keep it simple. Uh, if if you do something really, uh, sometimes people come up with very complex caching schemes, and then their their cache is always you start getting bad data in there or whatever else. Uh, I think maybe one of the mistakes that, that uh, people are doing a lot of times is they're so focused on like memcache or whatever that they're not actually giving enough memory to their database in the first place. Okay. And it wouldn't be so slow if they actually just uh, made sure that the, the database was primarily in memory. Yeah, that's a cache. We find you know, uh, a particular slave that's, that's got a copy of, of 25 tables. If we carve off five of those tables, we can put it on a really weak machine with mm -hmm. 16 gig of RAM, and it can service you know, 15,000 concurrent hits because it's primary key lookups. It's entirely in memory. It's fine. But if that same working set were spread out across a bunch of MySQL slaves, they'd all be thrashing because they all, they're all trying to keep that working set in at the same time. I've definitely found my, my use of, of relational databases has, has changed a lot since <laughs> working at scale. And I really think of them way more like, like, a, um, uh, like an operating system that has working sets and, and things that go into swap uh, and trying to find out how to take whole processes off of collections of servers and put them somewhere else. And one of the things that I think is actually really interesting about what all three of it's important to understand what data is volatile and how do you want to deal with that volatility because if you're constantly writing everything into your cache, you're going to end up with an awful lot of thrash. But at the same time, there's a lot of data that we deal with that just doesn't change much. Yeah. Uh, and so you know, creating elaborate caches and, and complex ways of moving things around for something that's relatively static is uh, you know, a lot of waste of engineering. And then uh, you know, the idea of keeping it simple I mean, sometimes the file system is really a very really effective way to cache things. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. And for static data, things that are generated once a day, yeah. top 10 lists, yeah. things that don't change, yeah. put it in a file. Let the file system do what it does. The file system has a great IO cache. You're, yeah. you're going to be able to do that. You know, unless you've got a thousand servers, you have to synchronize it to. But uh, yeah. you know, a filer, put it there, yeah. you know, and just attach and deal with files. Everything deals with files really, really nicely. We, yeah. we do a lot of logging. A lot of people do logging in the database, say, oh, this happened, that happened, and we're like, uh, that's too much I.O. <laughs> logging, <laughs> logging happens, and, and this is an area where RESTful style things are, are good. We do an, a ton of logging, uh, stats collection, click-through rates, performance yeah. data, um, and it just flows into uh, basically Apache logs. They're, they're lighty logs, but they're Apache format. And we process those offline, and we take, you know, 
gigs and gigs of this data. Sometimes we process it in-house. We're, we're working on processing it up in, the, uh, in EC2. Um, so, you know, there's just a lot of things. I, I agree with you. The file system does some things brilliantly, and especially writing on the end of a, of a log file and then and saying, I'm not going to have this data. Some of this data I'm not going to have only hourly or only daily or whatever, whatever yeah. it is. Uh, yeah. On the chat room, people were asking about Ruby on Rails. Oh, uh, okay. <laughs> and whether the, the Twitter problems could be fairly blamed on the, their choice of frameworks. And since you're on yeah. Ruby, I, yeah. I'd love to hear what... what yeah. Um, so we chose Ruby early on because we didn't have a... We had a whole, a whole group of people. We had some .NET people. We had some PHP people. And we had some... Um, uh, our, our original site used a, an early um, kind of template system. And, and I said, well, let's just use something that's going to be fun, w that'll help us attract developers, and that I really like coding in. So, so we chose Ruby on Rails. And the, the very first question that we had was, um, that I had was, can, can this scale at all? So we did some early performance tests on it. And the, the answer was, yeah, it scales. And it scales better than Java. But it needs some work. It needs master-slave replication uh, knowledge. It needs. Um, connection pooling for the database. It needs uh, it needs you to not use ORM caching. That's the one thing about this caching conversation that I would would say yeah. people people fall into the thing of saying, oh, I've got these beautiful whatever objects um, in the, the Ruby world. They're called active record objects. They say, oh, I'll just park these in memcache, and then when I want them again, I'll deserialize them from memcache, and then I'll do my work with them. And that's just not a good plan. The, the, the plan is, what are you trying to do? You're generating HTML. So generate the HTML and cache the HTML. You don't need a mess of objects. You don't need to parse them and bring them and, and reify them and then do something with them and then have the garbage collector throw them away. Create your HTML, park it, render it, and, and you're going to be a lot faster. So we, we strive to cache way more final product and, and way less kind of intermediary compute gunk. I don't know if that's, that's how, how you guys do it, too. Yeah. Um, we are looking forward to moving forward to a newer version of Rails with a better garbage collector. Yeah. But we run pretty old versions of everything. Um, and yeah, we do anywhere from 120,000 to 200,000 hits a minute running Rails. It's a happy, it's a happy platform for us. Um, I don't know kind of enough about Twitter to know all the reasons that, that Rails didn't work for them. But we use everything. We, we use active record and all the layers that, that they said early on, wow, these layers don't work. We're going we're gonna to pull them and go straight to, uh, straight to SQL and whatever. We, we haven't had that issue. How about you guys? Your choice of frameworks, it, does that measure into scalability? Well, I mean, for us, you know, we started rewriting our, our web tier probably about three years ago, and there weren't a lot of frameworks that we were comfortable choosing at that time and you know, sort of went down the, you know, it's not a not invented here, but at the same time, we invented it <laughs> and built our own MVC, which has its own pitfalls. Uh, you know, it's great if you can use something that's open source as a community that's developing it, supporting it, adding new features, fixing bugs, finding bugs, dealing with internationalization, multi-byte characters, all those kinds of things. We're, at this point, you know, we've got three years of code in our front end and saying maybe it's time to find a frame PHP. Mm -hmm. Do we go with the PHP framework? Do we hack something ourselves, you know, with something? So there, there, there's definitely a lot of camps uh, inside the engineering organization and people trying to figure out what to do, but ultimately it comes down to what problems are we trying to solve. Yeah. And I, I loved yours, you know, something I want to code in, but uh, I don't yeah. think I have that luxury it's anymore. A, you know, it's a tough one because in the end, Ruby has always been few logs that we generate. Sometimes I'm like, God, I just, I'm just going to use awk for this. This is, it's crazy to spin up Ruby to do this. And yet, at the same time, you know, two weeks later, when I have to be the person to fill the awk and somebody else is going, oh, I could have added this feature in Ruby in two seconds. I, I remember that that is the reason that we did it. It's readable code. It's consistent. Everything, almost everything, there are very few exceptions that we, that we don't uh, use Ruby for. And it's been a, it's been a benefit. I mean, knock wood. Maybe maybe we'll hit some new some new scale point. Yeah. I, be, I I don't think I know what what you guys uh, use. We use Python. I was going to say I bet yeah. that is Python. Good. <laughs> there's a, there's a little bit of. Uh, uh, I don't think we've had any real issues. Python's a good. It's pretty solid. I think yeah. it's. Uh, but any of these any of these languages will work. Uh, or all of them. <laughs> yeah. I mean, you can. Or all. It's totally true. That gets totally that gets uh, unmanageable. But yeah, I, I think I mean there's differences in in performance obviously, but. That's really just a question of efficiency, not scalability. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 
Um, when I was talking to Zuckerberg, he he he, he was jealous of your. Uh, uh, of your search engine, <laughs> and he said, "I have to build. I want to build a search engine just like that one." But I have 100 million users, and you guys have a million or somewhere in that neighborhood. Right. And the dip, tell me about how you would approach that problem if you were working at Facebook right now, because building a system for 100 million users, I expect, is a little bit different than building it for a, a couple million. It is, but actually not as different as as uh, you might think. I mean, fundamentally, if your system is going to scale, scalability is all about uh, divide and conquer. You partition the data and you just handle the same thing uh, you know, only with more data. And so you just keep breaking it down into smaller problems. And so you know, the, a lot of it just comes down to actually system management of how do you manage 10,000 machines or whatever it is when you're actually scaling to that size more than, more than the design. Uh, because I mean, Gmail obviously has that comparable scale as, as, uh, Facebook. as Facebook, and it has to be completely real time. Uh, and again, most of the problems we ran into there was just was just getting enough machines, keeping everything running. But but uh, it really all just comes down to partitioning your data. Yeah. What are you doing differently? Uh, um, because Google uh, doesn't index as fast as FriendFeed does, right? FriendFeed, I can write a comment, and then 20 seconds later, search on a word I put in that comment, and it comes back, right? Google doesn't work that fast. So what are you doing differently, and, ha and how architecturally are, are, did you lay out your system that's different from what Google did? Uh, well, I mean, Google is uh, crawling the web when, yeah. when they're doing that. So they don't, they, wouldn't, they don't know that you wrote the comment, for one thing. Uh, it, but also just the, the design of, of the Google web search is more batch-oriented. So every time period, they go out and, and index a new chunk of data. Uh, but other systems like FriendFeed obviously are, are more real time. But certainly some of the things that Google are that way too. Gmail, you know, you send an email and you can Based, right? Sure. Instead of crawl based or batch based. But it's it's a little bit more involved than that too because that actually uh, works its way through the whole design of the system. So when you've designed it to be batch based, you make a lot of different decisions. Uh, you know, like they obviously Google is famous for MapReduce. Mm -hmm. MapReduce isn't as good for something that's that's real time right. event based because. It's all about taking a big chunk of data and doing something with it right. uh, over a period of minutes, probably. Right. We'll soon start taking questions from uh, the people around the world. But uh, Jeff Fritz is asking some really good questions. I, I hear a lot of discussion about open source technologies like uh, Ruby on Rails or PHP, Java, Python. Why do we never really hear about ASP.NET scaling challenges? Is that because most of us in, in the startup world don't use ASP.NET? or? I'll, I'll tell you this a secret thing. I, I actually kicked off the .NET project with a group of people at, at Microsoft years ago. So it started out as what we called COM Plus, and it became the CLR, and then it became .NET, .NET and grew into what it is today. Uh, as a startup, evaluating running Microsoft hardware and software is sort of kind of our, our cost issue. At least this is what it was for us. Non-starter. It's a non-starter. <laughs> Yeah. Licensing. So, just kills you. yeah, if, if we were to run 400 Microsoft uh, uh, servers and we'd need more, we'd need more of them to run the scale we're doing right now because they're res more resource intensive, um, it, it, would, it would be daunting, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Cool. So we're about halfway through, so I'm, I'm going to start in introducing people from around the world who will start asking some questions. So. Um, I don't see what I need to on the uh, teleprompter, but uh, <laughs> <laughs> but that's all right. Uh, Jim Becker is on the line. Uh, Jim, are you there? I don't hear him. Well, we might not be able to take qu qu calls from Skype, but they're working on it. So. Uh, let's go to the chat room and take another question. Uh, Jeff Fritz again was saying. Uh, you did. Hello, are you there? Hi, everyone. Hi there. Um, this is Michael at Fast Company. Um, you are on the call and want to ask questions. Hi, everyone. Hello, everyone. Start putting them out there. Jim, can, can you go? I don't hear him, so. Um, yeah. So anyways, Jeff, uh, uh, Jeff Fritz asked regarding performance tracking and ac user activity logging, aren't queues like MSMQ and uh, MQ series much more efficient approaches to this out of cycle data activity compared to uh, using uh, No. Yeah. <laughs> okay. I don't know. I'd say no. Those things are, tr you know, those, those products have transactional capabilities. So if it was really important for me to know 
that hit, like if it, if I needed that for accounting or auditing for some reason, that that perhaps would be important. But if the if the failure rate there is in the sub, you know, hundredths of a percent of how many of those logs I lose or log lines I lose, uh, it doesn't matter. If if I were doing credit card processing, yeah, I, I would use it. Uh, I, I would use the, the right tool, but um, for for us anyway. That's a lot, a lot of overhead. Okay. Right, yeah, writing to the tail of a file seems to work, work pretty well <laughs> a lot of the time. Yeah, yeah, keep it very simple. All right, we have another caller. We're going to try this a couple more times. Okay. Before. <laughs> Jungle G, are you out there? Jungle G, please go ahead and ask your question, if you can hear me. Uh. Jungle, hello? Uh, I don't know. So anyways. Um, they're going to have to take care of that back behind scenes. Um, scalability is all about capacity planning. Uh, Susan Beebe asks, numerous aspects of systems design and potential failure must be examined and well planned in order to avert potential future failures. In an ideal world, you know those limits the system needs to scale to, but we don't live in a perfect. The question was, um, architecturally, how do, you, how do you approach a problem? It, you know, and, and what are some things architecturally that you look at doing to make sure that your systems scale up? <laughs> well, so, uh, you know, I think it really depends what you're building is the first question, right? So, so what are the, I think one of you mentioned earlier, what are your, your hard constraints? So for, for Gmail, we said we can't ever lose data. And that was the fundamental uh, decision that drives everything else. So even if the site goes on, it doesn't matter. The, the key thing is that we must never lose any data. And amazingly, I think we, we succeeded <laughs> at never, never losing anything. Uh, and so what we... Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Keep talking. <laughs> Sorry. Ignore the voice in your ear. <laughs> they're, they're trying to solve these problems with the, the call. So. All right. So, so uh, it, one of the decisions we made there was simply planning by limiting capacity, by limiting who was allowed into the system. Yeah. We had a pretty good idea of what traffic would look like because, or of what the, how much data we need to store because we could just extend the graph based on how many users we had, how much email they're receiving. Uh, for friend feed, obviously the constraints are a little bit different. Again, obviously we don't want to lose any data, but we don't, uh, we're, not, we're not keeping people out anymore. So our strategy has been more one of just trying to react as quickly as possible. Mm -hmm. uh, if we see that things are starting to get slow, and again, we have measurements, so we keep an eye on latency. If, if uh, latency starts rising, we start looking what's going on, we add capacity at that point. But you know, if, if uh, 100 million people showed up at FriendFeed tomorrow, it would, it would uh, not work. Yeah. <laughs> you, you talked to, uh, at one of the dinners I was at that um, you look at scalability as a window, and you always have to stay in the wi window and, and engage right, right? So right. if 100 million people showed up, it, the window would have jumped way exactly. ahead of you and you, you would have, uh, your choices probably would have been wrong, right? Right, right. You need to keep more data as you have today. Uh, unfortunately, we haven't always managed to stay within that, within that target, but it's, it's a good place to be because it gives you room for mistakes. Like if, if something goes wrong, you, you kind of have some breathing room. It gives you room for delays if hardware doesn't show up on time. Uh, it gives does. you room if you need to do something <laughs> like a, you're just changing your architecture or something and you're doing a big, a big change where, let's say you're changing the, the entire way the data is stored and so you need to have two copies for a while. Yeah. Uh, that's really hard to do if you don't have any spare capacity. Yeah. Yeah. And there's a really interesting thing that uh, we've been able to do and you know, part of it was planned, part of it was, well, we just did this thing and it turned out to be incredibly useful. When you partition, when you start separating things, you know, first off, you know, you break one big problem into n smaller problems, but you always have to remember you still have that plus one problem if you got to put it all back together again. The other thing is, when you have all of these individual pieces, if you have, you know, reliability uh, constraints, you need to actually have replicas of each of those partition pieces. Having some centralized system or decentralized system to record which things are the active ones, which are the backups, and if you need to put a partition and it has to be taken offline, one part fails, the entire system doesn't fail. And ideally, for those users whose data is now trapped in the thing that you had to take offline, you have some way of messaging to them. Yeah, that, that's from a database or any kind of data management architectural perspective is to consider cardinality and, and quantity. So what is cardinality? The, the, the number of users, like the, the, like how many, how many uh, if you have a table and it's going to 
30 million, uh, 30 million of those users. Um, so, or 50 million or 100 million, you're hoping to get there. So, um, so you know, the, this classic, the, the term, I don't even know who originated it, but I, I first read about it from Flickr, which is, which is sharding your users across, um, across databases. It basically said, you know, we have to be able to assign a user to a shard and be able to take that shard offline and, and bring it back up. And exactly like you're saying, the, the system will say, gosh, I'm sorry, your, your server is not available. I can't show you your profile, or I can't do this or that with you. So considering anything you do, that, that's probably the main thing we do now. When we have a new feature, the feature is going to come online. And we, don't, we can't really roll it out easily, especially on Facebook. Facebook's kind of a big on-off switch. You kind of ship all your code, or you don't. Um, on ilike.com, we can, we can phase things out. But Facebook doesn't doesn't have things like affinity to node affinity or lots of other things that it doesn't really have for us, um, and so we need th things to come online and not not explode. Yeah. Um, and so because of that, you know, we now know if a feature is coming online and it's about each user needing 10k of data, we, we know how to do that. Yeah. When you came out with Gmail, I thought you, you came out with an interesting uh, system to make sure that the window didn't get a whole, a, ahead of you, right? You limited the number right. of users mm -hmm. who could join the system at any one time, and yeah. to get into the system, you had to be invited by a friend, so you could have some predictability right, about right. it and, and some control. You could ratchet. Tell me a little bit about how that came up. And, uh, and uh, <laughs> Well, we were doing capacity planning, and uh, you know, honestly, they wouldn't give us any machines. <laughs> and so we, we actually launched with just a handful of, of machines. and. Uh, but we, we wanted to get it out there as, as quickly as possible. And so we, we came up with this invite model and uh, actually justified it as a growth strategy, not a, not a capacity thing, uh, and said, well, we're, we're going to do this to make it a viral, uh, viral thing. And, it's and, a marketing uh, strategy. Yeah, exactly. Oh, I like that. And, and, so, uh, it, and it, worked, it worked really well because it allowed us to always keep the service reliable, always keep the service fast, and make sure that the users that we did have were having a, a good user experience. Uh, and, and so that they would have very positive feelings about the product, they'd be happy, they'd invite their friends. You know, I didn't want to put something out there and have everyone say like, yeah, Gmail's cute, but it doesn't work at all. You know, especially when you're, when you're uh, releasing problems. Yeah. Um, I'm, take, I'm, I'm going to switch over to taking questions from the chat room. We're, not, we're going to give up on, the, on trying to get Skype to work. Um, one of the questions uh, that was interesting is that... Uh, so have monitors uh, that, that are just continually you know, pinging the different servers and, and checking that the results look right. And then they, uh, they page me if, it, if it's not working. Me yeah. too. <laughs> well, I mean, we have a, a bunch of different parts. So for the, you know, the crawling and data acquisition side of things, that's not necessarily user facing. It will yeah. impact latency and, and how much data shows up. But that's something where we're primarily doing internal monitoring. A lot of it is queue based. The queues can you know, accumulate, and you can have thresholds set. We, you know, we use Nagios for a lot of our monitoring. Yeah, we use Nagios Very also. simple checks to just say, if this queue gets greater than 100,000 entries, something's bogged down, send an email, send an alert. Obviously, one of the things you, you know, we've encountered is a few times where some particular table, typically with InnoDB, would get larger than you know, your threshold and then continue to grow. And in fact, the problem was the Nagios check that was doing the count star on the queue. Yeah. Uh, and it was adding too much load, you know, to be not being so good on the, the aggregate functions Doesn't on like large data sets. Star, does it? <laughs> uh, so th that's not a, a, you know, when your monitoring system is the root cause, that's a problem. So you turn that monitoring off, and then what do you do? So yeah. you look at different ways of looking at things. And what we've done there is, you know, shifting from a, uh, a volume-based metric for those types of tables to a heartbeat. So you have a replication slave, and as long as the, the data is replicating, it's not testing exactly the same thing but you can see whether or not you're, you're staying current. Yeah. 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 We use Nagios also. Uh, it's a great open source product for, for monitoring. Um, Nagios and MRTG we use Munin, M-U-N-I-N, as well to visualize. We can look at any node in the system and say, wow, that guy's out of memory, or, or he has more I.O. load than he should. Um, but that's a great investment to make, and it's such a cheap investment. You, yeah. you can put a Nagios and a Munin monitor system into place and grow to many hundreds of, of nodes with, without doing yeah. much. Where a lot of online services uh, fail is when rollouts of new stuff comes out. I, I, I saw Facebook go down for three hours one day because one of their engineers checked in some new features and it broke something. Yeah. How do you, you're planning new features for next week, right? Yeah, <laughs> well, we, we do new features every day. They're usually just very small, but th I think the key thing is everything you do has to be reversible. You never put something out that you can't take back because 
these problems do occur. Uh, and then if 